What's and Raw with Marty Gallagher and J.P. Bryce on ICTV. Today we're going to be discussing powerlifting Superman Dave Jacoby. For anyone not familiar with Dave, he's a national and world championship powerlifter, winning the IPF World Championships five times between 1984 and 1992. And Marty uh, knows all about him, so we're going to ask him some questions. Uh, well, I'd been watching Dave for years, right, when he would lift at the, at the Nationals and the Worlds, and in uh, 1991, I was selected as a world team coach for the United States, and the way that it works is we have three coaches, we have two what they call backstage coaches and one front coach, which uh, was Sean Scully, the... Uh, Sean was an Air Force major, and the front coach at a major championship handles the numbers. They, they find out where your athlete is doing in relation to the rest of the, uh, the pack. Yeah. So, you know, Sean had that kind of brain. Uh, myself and Bob Fortenbaugh, uh, we handled the, the, back, uh, the back athletes. There are 11 weight classes. We would divide them up. I got Dave asked for me, which I appreciated. Um, it's especially nice when the five-time world champion requests you to be his world championship team coach. Sure. At, at the Nationals, Dave was always coached by Pep Wall, and uh, I believe Dave was out of Akron, Ohio. Mm -hmm. The power players in Ohio were Larry Pacifico in Dayton with the Power Elite, and then up north you had uh, John Black up in Cleveland. And I coach for John. Uh, we won six national titles in three different federations over seven years. So uh, when I got selected as the world team coach, uh, I got to coach Dave, and that was in the 242-pound class. And in those days, it was uh, it was a walk in the park to win the worlds compared to how hard it was to win the American na national championships. We were so much better than the rest of the world that, you know, the, the battle was winning the Nationals. Dave would have to go up against Kirk Karwaski, Joe Ladnier, Thor Kritsky, Willie Bell, Hall of Fame guys, right, just to win the yeah. Nationals. When he got to the Worlds, it was a yawner. I mean, just, you know, he was 100, 100 pounds better than anybody else. But in... Uh, 91, he was having a bit, well, am I getting ahead of myself? Should I, should I let you guide the discussion? No, you're fine. Okay. Keep going. Uh, so in 91, he was off, but that was okay because even if he was off, he was still way better than anybody else. So I, we, uh, it was kind of a strange thing. He, he hit an 804 second attempt squat and Sean put in the third of 832. And when he told Dave that he put in 832, Dave basically freaked out. He said, Sean, why did you do that? I wanted 821. So that was an issue. So he barely missed the 832. Well, that cost us 20, 26 or 28 pounds right there. On his second attempt bench press, he tore his pec. Right. Actually, on his first attempt bench press, let me see. Yeah, we opened with 452, made that. I think we jumped to 474, and I think on that that attempt, that's when he tore the pec. Uh, bad. I mean, to the point that it immediately started pooling blood. And, uh, you know. what, what were your thoughts when that initially happened? Well, it was over. He's like done. He, you know, he just had a serious injury, and yeah, he's out. You know. I mean, it was, a, it was a big deal. Uh, and you, you guys came to him and let him make that decision. You guys came and said, look, you can well, we you had Well, we had a team doctor, the team doctor, Dick Herrick, myself, Sean, Scully, uh, and Dave. And, you know, we were like, you know, Sean's like, can you pull or not? You know, you can't bench anymore. We know that. Can you pull or not? 
and yes or no. And if you can't, that's fine. You know, you did great. We understand that. I mean, you just ripped your damn peck off. You're going to have to have surgery. Uh, and Dave said, no. He said, I, I, he said I, let me try one. So I said, all right, what do we put you in for? He said, well, put it in 704. So uh, we were ahead of a Norwegian guy who's a good lifter, not a great lifter, good lifter. And the Norwegian guy, I believe, had to pull five more, whatever Dave pulled, he needed to pull five more kilos, 11 pounds, in order to tie him and beat Dave on body weight. So here we go. So Dave made the 704. We couldn't do any warm-ups because he couldn't risk it. He, his arm was freezing up, you know, he's, he's like sh shriveled up. And he pulled a 704, but it was a tough thing. I mean, it wasn't an easy thing, right? So immediately the Norwegian dude comes back and pulls whatever, 718, whatever he needed. Just ties him. Now we got to pull again. So Dave jumped to, I believe, 722. Made that. And he was hurting. Again, same question. Can you go on? Yeah, one more. And... Uh, you know, he missed the attempt. The Norwegian guy made the attempt, and, you know, Dave got beat. And it was, you know, he didn't cry or, you know, he didn't you know, fall down or anything. He just said, you know, that's the a, that's a damn breaks, you know. And he just took it like a pro. But the next year he came back and slaughtered everybody. Then he quit. <laughs> so, yeah, <laughs> the end of it. Sunset, right? Rode off in his diesel truck into the sunset, never to be seen from again. It was in Orbro, Sweden. It was in Orbro, Sweden. Yep. So his usual coach, Pep Wall, yep. he couldn't make the trip, or what happened with that? I don't think Pep went to the Worlds. You okay. know, I think he just went to the Nationals. Uh, you, you know. So the, the funny thing that the, the funny thing about this story is oh God, here we go. you get introduced to. Uh, Yeah, I didn't look forward to that. So what happened? This was before, what, a squat? Oh, uh, yeah, before all these lifts, Dave was a big believer in what the hell did they call it, the heightened arousal mode or some crazy yeah. phrase that they had back then. And basically was, you slap the hell out of the guy's face. The heightened arousal mode, right? So, and Pep, Pep was pretty damn good at it with Dave, but, you know, it's like, I didn't, I wasn't a slapper and I wasn't a receiver, you know what I mean? Not that there's anything yeah. wrong with it. Uh, but I knew that being his coach, that he was going to want me to whack him in the face before his, uh, his lifts. So I went out in the first attempt squat, and it's a big deal. He's the defending world champion. They hate him. They're all booing him. The, the Swedes had these crazy little horns that they blow. It was just cowbells if they didn't like you, and I forget what they do. They they didn't boo us. They did something I can't remember. They hooted us or something. Anyway, so we go out and we're we're Satan. And so Dave says, "All right, Marty, lay it on me." And so I slap him, and I hear all the coaches and stuff. They're like snickering. <laughs> There's afraid. Oh, I guess they're afraid that he might might hurt their precious world champion and make him fall down and cry. He did him good. So Dave said, Marty, this is for real. Do it. And so I laid back and cracked him so hard. And he's like, afterwards, he goes, thank you. <laughs> and he goes out and cr crushes, and he crushes the weight. Well, I had to do three squats and one bench before he hurt himself. But the next day, my hand was swollen up like a catcher's mitt, right, from smacking his yeah. face. He saw me. A couple days later, he said, oh, I heard about your hand. He said, thanks for taking one for the team. <laughs> well, he get, yeah, he gets a slap, and he take uh, you know, an ammonia, crack that thing, snort that, throw that behind him, and go up to the bar and just kick ass. Well, he was plenty scary enough without any of that. Pristine. You refer to it, his squat, as a sumo squat. 
Perfect. Uh, yes, per perfection. Wide, super wide stance, super upright torso, vertical shins, knees over the ankles, all the good stuff. Uh, I think his best was 880 at 242, right? Uh, balance lifter, great bencher, great uh, wide grip bench presser, you know, consistent five something, you know. Uh, deadlift, same thing. Always 770, 780, perfect sumo style, upright, yeah. all muscle. But he looked like, I mean, because he lifted with pristine technique, he had a magnificent body. He bore the weight. It was These were low squats. These were perfect deadlifts. It was like, yeah, that's what happens when you get that damn strong. Yeah, actually, you know, he was about, from the stats I've seen, he was about 5'8", 242 pounds. Yeah, and he probably had to shed a few to get down. But he had a small yeah. waist. He had a very small waist. Super wide shape. I mean, he had a great physique. Yeah, absolutely. Good um, athlete. But you can, uh, you know, there's, you know, he was, lift, he was lifting back in the mid-80s, uh, late 80s, so the video quality isn't, you know, as good as we have now, of course. But you can see a bunch of different videos of him um, squatting, benching, deadlifting. But if you look at his squat, you know, talking about um, sumo squats, he he would, uh, you know, walk the bar back. He would take a step, a couple of steps on each side six. sideways. Six. It took and him. Then it, it took him. He, he was done. He would pivot his feet out and. God love him. I mean, that's a, that's a wide squat stance. I personally couldn't do that. But I'll tell you what, when he goes down to parallel, you, there's nothing under him. You couldn't do a squat stance wider than 14 inches. <laughs> <laughs> then, you, then you'd split apart. Yeah. Dave took but, six steps for his walkout. Six. Step back. One, two... Three, four, five, six. Turn your toes out. Now we're ready. It's like, oh my god. And and when you think about that, just think about all of the energy that that he's uh, you know he's he's burning off right there. I mean, he's got to do all that stepping, and then he's not done. Then he's got to do his lift, and then he's got to reverse all that, step back in, and then go rack it. Oh, that's easy. That's nothing. If you made it, you're you're thrilled. Plus, you got help. Yeah. That that's that's but, no but problem. But some work. Yeah, no, no, no shit. And he had the, the very wide sumo uh, deadlift. Correct. Well, he wanted to use the same power groove. He developed tremendous power with that squat stance. Well, why not replicate it in the sumo and use that same power band? Right. right. Made perfect sense. But, What's interesting about him is he was a, he was a truck driver, wasn't he? Correct. Well, allegedly. Allegedly. Yeah. We don't want to get in any trouble, so we say allegedly. Um, no, but that's that's as far as we know. And uh, but therefore, you know, we we don't know exactly what he did, but he was, if he was long haul. And did that, you know, sometimes those guys are gone for a week at a time. Supposedly, so he suppo come. supposedly he only trained one day a week. So that's what I was leading up to. So one day a week. So describe kind of, you know, what he would get done in that that one day a week. I mean, was he, a, he must have been a minimalist or was he a volume guy in one day a week? I mean, that would be a lot well, for we, one day. We, we did the same thing at Ken Fantano's when I was in uh, Connecticut in '89. All those guys up there, they couldn't they couldn't train during the week because of the type of jobs they had. So we'd get together on Sunday, and he'd lock the gym up, and it might take us three hours, you know. But we'd squat, bench, dead, do some arm work, and you know, be done for the week. Now, now Ken would come back in two days later and do some heavy inclines. Uh, but the rest of the guys, you know, we, we trained hard and heavy one day a week, and that's all the time we had. Uh, I won the Connecticut State Championships that year. I squatted 660 at 220, and deadlifted 650 using that beam 
relegated to one, one day a week. But, but as you've said in the past, I mean, and you can do this with your current guys on Sundays. You guys all get together yep. and, and lift, and you do it all in one day. And you, you've made the uh, point, you know, more times than once that this is the best type of training well, it, for it, it, competition. Yeah. I don't know if it's just necessarily the best, but it's another valid arrow in the quiver, certainly. And all these guys are making progress. And it, those, the boys that I work with, they're just sort of, um, they're kind of neighborhood guys, you know, and they have real jobs and they have real responsibilities and everybody's got families and problems. And so they get together once a week and we knock the shit out of it. And I'm there to check their techniques and their intensity level, right? Right. So, and Kirk, Kirk, Kirk might show up 50% of the time. Bobby Myers might show up. These are national level coaches that are there. And, and so these boys step up when they step off in front of us. Uh, and, and everybody every week improves. And everybody over time improves. And it's like, how is that possible? They're only doing three lifts. They're doing squat benches and deads. Now, do they have time and do some arms? Maybe, maybe not. You know, but yet, yet they progress. It's so it's self-justifying. But aside from that, it's mathematical. I mean, this is mathematical progression. This is yeah. they start here, and twelve weeks later, they're here. This isn't some subjective like, oh, I think they do the double backflip much better. No, 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 no. They increase their deadlift fifty pounds well, with I no increase in body weight. If you're actually a competitive powerlifter, because what does that do? It when you go to a powerlifting meet, you have to do all the lifts in a single day. Oh yeah, okay. And and when you're training like that one day a week, well, you've already prepared yourself for that long meet, that long day. Well, I think that's extremely simplistic. Okay, I think it has great validity for normal people. I mean, how about the well, people who don't have any yeah. time to, time at work, right? I mean, they got to, you know. I think that's who the that's the who the breakout is to when normal people finally figure out, you know, I only have to do strength training, and we're talking absolute strength, not necessarily sustained strength, not necessarily explosive strength, but certainly absolute strength, isometric strength, muscle building strength, right? Right. You can get by with, you know, 30 to 60 minutes a week and improve. That's huge. But no one wants to hear it or believe it. You know, well, that, yeah, and, you know, before we, we got on here, we were talking with uh, some of the guys over there about how simplistic the um, it, it all really is. I mean, you look at the Internet, you look at social media, Everything has become so convoluted. Everybody's got a better idea. But when you, it comes down to it, the stuff that you guys have been doing for, you know, even dating back to the 60s, 50s, some of 40s. That, a lot of that stuff is still in play today and can be used to become a world champion. Nobody, nobody did less than Mark Chalet, <laughs> who I love. I love Mark. Mark's like my brother. Uh, but what he showed me, uh, the possibilities of minimalism. I mean, imagine, this is a guy worked up to a single rep in the squat and the bench press on Monday, a single rep in the deadlift on Thursday, and didn't do anything else. Nothing. 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 Okay? And he turned himself into a world champion. He deadlifted 880. He squatted a thousand. He benched five hundred plus, and he was unswayable. I mean, he didn't entertain or do anything else. He goes, "Nope, that's the way I train. That's what works for me. That's what I'm doing." I'm like, "Damn!" And he got results for his people. Mark's problem was is that was the only arrow in his quiver, right? So uh, that eventually kind of wore, wore out, but I'm telling you, never has a man done less and gone further. You know, and some of these guys, 
were just muscular <laughs> single as well. Well, but but the, but what came first, the chicken or the egg? I mean, right. You know, did this did this ultra low high intensity training do this you for know, these guys? I, obviously, these guys were monsters. You know, we posted the video of Kowalski on his beach week from '94, uh, <laughs> yeah. and we've got a lot of comments on there. I mean, if you get on YouTube and just type in. Kowalski beach video, you'll see it. This dude is so massive and muscular. There's so many people that have commented, hey, you should have got into a bodybuilding show, which I think he almost did. He, he, no, bodybuilding was not for Kirk. It wasn't for Kirk, but he did think about doing that one time. Yeah, Kirk was a collection of great body parts. <laughs> great, great arms, great... Great arms, great legs, no flow. The, po the point being, though, these guys did were minimalist. Uh, Kirk did some curls and stuff here and there, but when you three sets, about, of, three sets, three sets, three sets a week. Yeah, that was his arm a work. A week, that's a it. week. And he said he would strict curl, alternate, alternate curl, uh, dumbbell curl the hundreds. Oh yeah, he'd walk for, in and be strict reps. He'd be curling hundreds, and he'd look up and he'd go, "Hey, how you doing?" Right. And he, if you look at some of these videos, he had some of the, the most incredible arms, biceps. Unbelievable. I mean, he's just yeah. And and these guys built these muscular foundations on this minimalist work, so they had you know world class power, world class muscle development. So. And the and yeah, and these boys were athletic too. These were not the non-functional bodybuilders. Most of the major league bodybuilders that I came across had very little in the way of athletic backgrounds, right? But the, the lifters were different. They almost invariably had high-level athletic backgrounds, and then they got into lifting. So it was a different breed of cat. Let's save that for when we do Joe. I want to do Joe Ladnier. He deserves his own show. Okay. And I got company here. We want to go drink beer. And you know what I mean? Oh. <laughs> well, why wasn't I invited? Plus, it's what well, you are. Oh. Well, you, thank you. You are. You, you're a native. You're from the neighborhood. What are you talking about? I'm from over that area. Yeah. I know where you're at. You're, you're two miles down the road in, the, in Hillbilly Hollow. No, nah, just how great he was, and he doesn't deserve to be forgotten. Not that anybody even knows who he is. Uh, and that those guys were really incredible, but the training has been lost, you know. So that's, that's what we're trying to revive, <clears throat> bring and back that. Wish, and we only wish that back then when these guys were competing, we had, like, uh, Instagram and, you know, high-def cell phones and, and all that because unfortunately some of this footage is just impossible to find oh we didn't we didn't take photos we, you know we were like i wanted in three states don't take those what are you doing right fortunately and Kirk <laughs> told me this he said you were the reason that he went out and got a video camera yes yes and, yes, yes, yes and which was a great idea because then you can really analyze it kind of like the, you know analyze the list like a, a a football game. Oh, yeah. Back, like back, football. back in the 80s, you'd have a camera this big. You had to have a battery pack and some other and a cable that had to be plugged into the wall. Uh, it was awkward. The nuclear fusion. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And, and yeah. you still got the worst videos ever. Right. <clears throat> All right. We good? Yeah, yeah. You want to plug the, the you want to plug the Kirk bar? We've got the Kirk bar. Genuine IPF spec power bar. Get on there. Get, go to uh, 
Kirkus massaged every one. Every, yeah, every mean, single it's, one. Look, it's USA made. It's, uh, you know, Kirk and I put this together. I said, look, give them everything that you liked as a power bar and let's build that bar. And we did, and we think we uh, we have it on the, on the site at a fair price. So go check it out. Just type in Karwaski. And it's blue. Um, also, also, don't forget to check out Marty's weekly column and now podcast, uh, Raw with Marty Gallagher. Go to ironcompany.com and to see his articles, you can just go up to the top of our website where it says articles. Click on that. Go to Raw with Marty Gallagher. And if you want to hear this again, it'll be on um, Facebook or be on YouTube. But there's also a link at the bottom of our site in the footer that says um, it says uh, podcast. So you can click on that. We archive all the shows in case you you miss one or want to hear one again. Um, if you want to learn more about Dave Jacoby, uh, we just posted a, an article in the, the raw section. It's called In the Competitive Foxhole with Dave Jacoby. Read that. Who wrote that? That was a lot of what we talked about today, but there's some other stuff in there that we didn't get to. Uh, and then Marty's got a whole bunch of books. You want to touch on that? No, I, I tell you, man, I've got a dog on the loose here that's going to bite my guest. <laughs> All right, I'll make it fast. All right, look, look I do have a couple of uh, personal trainings spots available so if you're, yes. if you're interested in taking your whatever to the next level then uh, get in contact with me through the Iron Company website and uh, yeah. we'll make online it online training just go to our athletes page and Marty's contact info is there no, uh, and for all your, your equipment needs, strength equipment, free weights, cardio, anything else uh, please visit Iron Company and, and uh, check us out, we'll help you out with anything you might need and um, that's it, so we're going to wrap it up, and we'll hopefully be back here and do another one of these next week. Roger that.